So this will be our second part of the study guide and we're going to continue with the periodic table. Now there is a lot of information we can be able to extract from the periodic table and we're going to start with the most basic things. That will be uh, telling the difference between the metals, the non-metals, and the metalloids. So first we have to locate uh, uh, where are they on the periodic table and we need to find uh, the metalloids first, okay? So that's easier. Now go here to boron, the first one on the P block, and draw a staircase. When you draw the staircase, this staircase tells you where are the metalloids. So here we have boron is a metalloid, this two, silicon and germanium, they're also metalloids. Arsenic and antimony, they are metalloids. Tellurium is also a metalloid. Uh, polonium will be a metal, and sometimes astatine is considered a metalloid. Okay, so here we have, we're super sure about this being, uh, being metalloids. So everything that's on the left will be metals, including the rare earth metals, and everything on the right of the staircase will be non metals plus hydrogen. Remember, hydrogen here is also a non-metal. Now, hydrogen is located on top of the alkali metals, but that doesn't make it an alkali metal. Now, we're going to talk about the families. So if you notice, a periodic table has different columns, and each column represents a family. So the first family here, without hydrogen, will be the alkali metals. Then our second column here, group two, will be the alkaline earth metals. These are the transition metals, so basically the D block. And then we have the third group here, which is the boron family. And then we have the carbon family, so this other column. And then we have the nitrogens with nitrogen as the head of the family. And then we have the chalcogens here with oxygen, the halogens with fluorine as the head of the family, and finally the noble gases, which is the last column on the periodic table. Then here on the bottom, we have the rare earth metals, and the first uh, row will be the lanthanide series, and then we have the actinide series here. Speaking of rows, we also have rows on the periodic table. So the first row, which only includes hydrogen and helium, that will be my first energy level, energy level 1. The second row will be energy level 2, and then the third row will be energy level 3. Then we have energy level number four, then we have energy level number five, number six, and the last energy level will be seven. So here's a question for you. How many uh, subshells and which of them, which are their names, are located on the sixth energy level? So pause the video and answer how many, uh, which are the subshells located in the sixth energy level? So hopefully you got that right. On the sixth energy level, we have the 6S subshell. We also have the 4F subshell. And we have the 5D subshell and the 6P subshell. So all of these are located within the sixth energy level. Now the periodic table, uh, remember from, from the periodic table, we can also determine the valence electrons for specific elements, and from the number of valence electrons, we can predict a charge. So again, the first family, alkaline metals and hydrogen included, will have one valence electron, and therefore, when they lose this valence electron, their charge will be positive one. Second family, we have two valence electrons, so a charge of positive two. We skip the transition metals. Then we have the third group here, has three valence electrons and a charge of plus three. Then we have carbon family with four valence electrons, but we don't talk about charges for carbon family because they will be, uh, they will not lose or gain electrons, they will share, uh, but that's part of our next unit bonding. Then we have the nitrogens with five valence electrons and a charge of negative three. Oxygen family or chalcogens, we have six valence electrons and a charge of negative two. Halogens, we have seven valence electrons and a charge of negative one. And finally, noble gases, we have eight valence electrons and a charge of zero. So, I have another question for you. Why are noble gases stable? Now, don't answer because they have eight valence electrons and their shell is full. Uh, that's not a complete answer. 
Noble gases are stable because they have high ionization energies. And this uh, high ionization en energies are because they have a very high effective nuclear charge. So there is a strong pull from the nucleus without a lot of, shield, uh, of shielding for the valence electrons. Okay, so we have, uh, we're not going to a next energy level. We start here in this, within this energy level, for example, neon, this is the one that has the highest number of protons without going to the next energy level, okay? Now, they also have very low electronegativity because when we add an electron, that will put uh, that electron in the new valence shell and there will be a lot of shielding now, okay? So that will mean a low effective nuclear charge and the atom cannot hold it, cannot hold this electron. So um, that won't be possible. So uh, they are difficult for, for noble gases. It's difficult for them to lose or gain electrons, and that's why they're stable. Now, from the periodic table, you also have to know properties of all the different families, and you, ha you have to be able to identify and explain why trends, uh, what different kinds of trends we have in the periodic table, okay? So here we have different trends on the periodic table. The first one here, upper left, we have the atomic radius. And you should be able to explain why this trend occurs on the periodic table. So we see the atomic radius is increasing as we go down, but it decreases as we move to the right, okay? So you should be able to, to explain that as we move to the right, we are adding more electrons. So that means a higher effective nuclear charge that pulls the electrons closer to the nucleus, okay? There's not a lot of shielding going on because we're still on the same energy level, so the electrons that are on the valence shell will be closer, will, will be uh, pulled closer to the nucleus as we move to the right, okay? So that's one, one example here. We also have electronegativity, which is here on the bottom, and we see how electronegativity is increasing as we move to the right, we don't have electronegativity values for this one's here um, for noble gases, but it also uh, electronegativity decreases as we move down. Okay, so for example, here we see here with the halogens is probably easier to see how it is decreasing. So again, uh, try to explain using your own words why the electronegativity will increase as we move to the right and will decrease as we move down the periodic table. So think about Coulomb's law, think about the effective nuclear charge, think about the radius, what is happening to the radius, and, and same thing for ionization energy, uh, very similar to electronegativity. It's increasing as we move to the right and it decreases as we move down the periodic table, okay? So again, try to use your own words to um, describe why the trends are occurring here in the periodic table. Then we have atomic radius versus ionic radius. And this is something, so you have this handout, however, it was printed in black and white, and that's probably very confusing. So right now, what I want you to do is pause the video, find the handout, and take two different colored pencils so you can color your handout and be able to see the difference between the cations and the anions. So let's see why they're different. Now in the first three columns, we have cations and uh, we see that the positive, the positive ion here has a smaller radius than the neutral ion, okay? Now, why does this happen? Let's take a look at sodium. When sodium loses one electron, it ends up with a positive charge and it now resembles argon, okay? But actually just lost the electron. It didn't lose its proton, it's still sodium. So what happens here is that we, with this electron lost, we move, uh, we lost a shell, okay? So we no longer have this valence shell with us. And the this extra, well, not an extra proton, but we do have kind of like an extra proton there because the electron was lost. So there is a stronger um, effective nuclear charge pulling the electrons that are on the outer shell now 
which uh, this outer shell now looks like the one in argon and these are pulling them closer. So this is one, uh, that's one of the reasons why this is happening. Now if we take a look here, for example chlorine, chlorine has, uh, we have an, an anion here with a negative one charge and what happened was that we added one electron. When we add this electron, we're still on the same energy level, so there's really, really not a lot of shielding taking place because we didn't add an extra energy level, we're still talking about the same energy level, and we didn't add more, more protons, so chlorine has still 17 protons. What happens here is that the effective nuclear charge is not as strong and the atomic radius increases as we add another another electron to our outer shell. So shielding uh, is not increasing at all and we see that the radius uh, for this for this ion uh, increases. Now let's solve isoelectric configurations. So isoelectric means that it has the same, that's the, the prefix iso, and we, we will have same electron configurations for different elements. So right now I need you to write the electron configuration for the following elements. So let's see uh, how, how well did you, uh, did you do there? So the first one, argon, a noble gas, that's the electron configuration. We have 1 is 2, 2 is 2, 2 p6, 3 is 2, and 3 p6. Then we have calcium. Now, notice here that this is a calcium cation, so that means that it lost two electrons. So how do we know how to write the electron configuration? Well, on blue we have the electron configuration for just neutral, regular calcium. And to this electron configuration, to the original one, which is uh, neutral calcium here, we are going to take away the last two electrons, so the electrons on the valence shell. Yes, so 4s2 will have to go, and that leaves us with 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2, 3p6, which is exactly the same as argon, because if you look in the periodic table, when calcium loses two electrons, it loses its outer shell, and it now resembles argon. Finally, we have chlorine, and this is, um, this is an ion here with a negative one charge. So it means that for regular chlorine, we start here with the neutral atom, which has this electron configuration, but we need to add one electron here in the last, uh, in the last subshell. So instead of having 3p5 for regular chlorine, for this ion, we'll have 3p6. So I added one electron. And again, we see that this electron configuration is exactly the same as the electron configuration for argon, because if you look on the periodic table, chlorine is just right behind argon. So the minute we add one extra electron, it will look like um, the next noble gas, which is argon. Okay, so hopefully you got those correct. And that's the end of our study guide. So, uh, however, this doesn't mean that what we cover in the study guide is only the things that will be on the exam. Remember that you have to study everything we covered uh, on this unit. So, uh, study your notes, study um, workbook pages, presentations, projects, everything we did. Uh, keep calm, uh, try to study, keep on working. And if you have any other questions, please ask me or Ms. Backus, and we'll see you on the test. Good luck!